Oh, hello. Hey, how are you? Let's have some more of Garth Nick's book, shall we? This one, incidentally, is called Drowned Wednesday. And, incidentally, -a, book three of the Keys to the Kingdom series. I know that's not a word. So, um, yeah, do you remember they were Arthur and Susie were rats, weren't they? Going through Feverfuse Worldlet. And then they weren't rats anymore. They took their disguises off and they were walking through that bit. They were trying to find, I can't remember the name of the little faction that they were trying to find, but they were on their way to find the faction. And then someone finished off the chapter, that is, with... I can't remember the voice I did. Oh, maybe it was foreboding. It wasn't. Shrill. Was it? It was foreboding. Who speaks of fever for you? Oh, yeah. Boomed a voice out of the undergrowth. A deep, powerful voice. That, that was the clue I got. Trained to rise above the fiercest gale. Sounds like the voice I use at school sometimes. <laughs> In assembly. <laughs> anyway, let's get cracking. Who speaks of fever for you? Arthur and Susie leapt to their feet and drew their weapons, but there was no sign of the person who'd spoken. The rainforest around them was quiet and still. No one ever looks up, continued the voice. Interesting, isn't it? Arthur looked up, his sword at the ready. There was a denizen high up in the nearest tree, hanging on with the aid of hooked spurs in his boots and what looked like clawed gloves, though Arthur wasn't entirely sure if the gloves or if they were gloves or actually the denizen's hands. He was wearing a shirt and breeches of light tan splattered with patches of green mould, a flecked if camouflage for the rainforest, particularly since the mould looked like it had spread across the denizen's skin as well. Now for the traditional questions, said the denizen, and the traditional warning. Answer correctly or you will die where you stand, or, to tell the truth, die a bit later because our arrows, while tipped with nothing contaminated mud, are not very effective. Doesn't sound very foreboding now, does he? Arthur looked round as the denizen spoke. There were rustlings in the undergrowth around them as he spotted several other green mould and tan-wearing denizens moving up on him. Oh. Been to see my mum and dad tonight. They got a cat. I wasn't kissing it or anything, stroking it. I'm not reckon. <laughs> anyway. We're friends, called out Arthur. We're looking for the followers of the carp. Can you uh, just wait for the questions? Asked the denizen up the tree. Let's, let, let's just do this properly, OK? Sure, said Arthur. Susie yawned and sat back down. Denizens, she muttered to herself. Are you now, or have you ever been, a pirate? No, said Arthur. Do you serve the pirate fever few in any capacity? No, said Arthur. Do you believe in the carp? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. I want to meet it. Is that a no? Asked the denizen. Arthur took a sideways glance at the bow-wielding denizens who were knocking arrows and drawing bowstrings back. We do believe in the carp, don't we, Susie? Yeah, sure, I'll believe whatever you want. You must have faith in the carp said the denizen. This statement was echoed in a whisper all round. Faith in the cup, faith in the cup, faith in the cup. Other nid Arthur nodded <laughs> vigorously several times, indicating that he had tons of faith in the cup. Now, also, for the record, state your names. Arthur thought for a moment. If the cup is who I think it is, I can't go wrong. But if it isn't, then... This here is Lord Arthur, master of the lower house, lord of the far reaches, hero of the house, eater of the biscuit and rightful heir of the old lot, said Susie, standing up again. And I am Susanna, Monday's tear, so you better act a bit more respectful if you don't mind. Really? said the denizen in the tree. I mean, I have faith and all, but are you really the rightful heir? Yeah, I am. Can you take us to the cup? And you're going to rescue us? Are you going to rescue us all from Feverfew's dominion? What? Huh? Rescue us, like the carp says you will. Um, I'll have to talk to the carp first. How many of you are there? said Susie. She was staring out between two of the trees where more and more green-tinged denizens were becoming visible as they moved out of cover. 779. At last count. <laughs> 
said the denizen as he slid down a tree trunk, his boot spikes shredding back. He landed and bowed in one smooth motion. Allow me to present myself. I am Jebaniza, first follower of the carp and formerly second mate of the Naiad. May her wooden bones rot in peace. Before Arthur could answer, a female denizen pushed forward and bowed, declaring, I am the second follower of the carp. My name is Panina. I am the third follower. My name is Garam. I have faith in the carp. A cacophony of voices. I love that word. A cacophony. Let that come out of my mouth. A voice is followed, with denizens shouting out their names, their numerical ranking as followers and various protestations of faith in the cup, belief that the rightful heir would come, and other stuff that Arthur couldn't hear properly over the din. Hang on a second, I've got to get rid of this hair. Embarrassingly, it wasn't a cat hair. It was one of my moustache hairs tucking into my mouth. <laughs> anyway. Oh, dear. As they shouted, more denizens moved closer and closer. More and more of them appeared out of the undergrowth till there was a great crowd advancing on Arthur. Um, I think I'd like to see the carp right now, said Arthur as he retreated back again against a tree trunk. Many of the denizens had forgotten to put away their nothing poisoned arrows and there were lots of muddy, sharp arrowheads sticking out ahead of them straight at Arthur. The rightful heir says everyone take three steps back, all right? shouted Susie, but even her sharp voice was lost in a tumult. I'm the 99th follower. 106th, I believe. Faith in the cup, the cup. Three steps back, roared Jebenezer at a volume to match Sunscorch's best shout. The denizens halted, then, after some scuffling, stepped back. Arthur took a breath, found he couldn't get a, a full lungful and concentrated on staying calm. Lord Arthur would like to see the carp, said Susie. I'm in a bit of a hurry, said Arthur, with a slight wheeze underlined to his words. He looked at his watch. They'd been out of the submersible for two hours, ten hours to go before the Belena departed. And now, he had nearly 800 denizens thinking he was going to do something for them as well. Of course, sir, follow me, said Jebenezer. He pushed two denizens aside and gestured at the others to move and make Arthur a path through the cloud. Crowd. It's just natural high spirits, sir, most of us having been trapped on this island for so long and in fear of recapture. Fever few always sinks, captured slaves. Sinks? asked Susie. In the hot lake, Jebenezer continued. If the mud doesn't drown you or the heat burn you up, the patches of nothing do the business. Nothing's quick, of course, or should be, but fever if you doesn't let, but fever if you don't let that happen. Sorry, I'm speaking a little bit too posh for him, aren't I? He's got a yard arm rigged up so he can lower you in a bit at a time, like a leg or whatever, a hand usually. He likes to start with the hands. Yeah, I get the idea interrupted Arthur. He felt very tense. Every minute wasted could mean disaster, and he had so many problems and so many decisions to make. And then there was the asthma lurking. Where is this carp? said Susie. Is it far from here? Why, the carp is under our feet, ma'am, where the carp first freed the slaves. That's the first twenty, which is me and Panina and Garam and Obelim and Harosh and Pepito and Thin Edric and Maybe save everybody's names for later, said Arthur. Just tell me the basic story. Well, when the carp freed us from our shackles in the dead of night, we picked him up and carried him into these hills. He said if we had faith and looked around, we'd find a place to shelter, a fortress safe from fever few. And sure enough, we found a mighty cave and it has served us, as our ever, served us ever since as our home. And the carp said that we must have faith that the rightful heir would one day come and bring us all back to the house and blow me down if it isn't happening, and me still here without being dissolved into nothing or my bones bleaching out in the stomach. Here we are. The denizen stopped before what appeared to be a cliff face, a vertical section of pale yellow rock, liberally covered with the same green mould or lichen that grew on his clothes and still. Please, just step through, sir. It looks solid, but if you believe it to be a door, as the carp says, it'll be a door. That carp sounds like a right pain in the midsection, grumbled Susie in a low voice to Arthur. And a faker as well. I bet it just made the cavern entrance look like this and carried on with all that belief hocus-pocus. 
We won't get that mould growing on us, will we? Arthur asked Jebenezer. Oh, no, sir. That's the carp special moss, moss that is, not mould. It takes cultivation to get that growing right, that does. Arthur shut his eyes and stepped forward, holding his hands in front of his face, just in case he did run straight into a mossy cliff. After four or five paces, when he sudden, didn't suddenly impact with rock, Arthur opened his eyes. He found himself in soft darkness, lit here and there by soft green lights. Some of the lights moved, including one close, bright clump of green lights above Arthur's head. The moss is luminous. Aye, it shines in the darkness to illuminate our path, said Jebenezer, as does the carp. It doesn't shine very well, and I can't see a path in front of me, said Susie. Arthur looked around, but he couldn't see anything more than a few feet away. But judging from the echo of Susie's voice and the patches of both moving and static green light, he knew he had to be standing inside a huge cavern somewhere near the top. It looked like it extended downward for a few hundred feet and back for at least as far. The path to the cup is a little difficult, admitted Jebenezer, even with the gift of our light. I'd better go first, and you might care to hold the back of my belt, sir. Miss Susie, please hold our Lord Arthur's coattails. Susie muttered something that Arthur felt he was probably glad not to hear. He reached out and hooked two fingers through the back of Jebenezer's belt. With one leg not as nimble as it should be, though the crab armour did do a great job, he didn't want to take any risks in the dark. He felt Susie grab hold of his coattails a moment later. As a makeshift train, it was a slow shuffle down. Most of the time, Arthur couldn't see how narrow the path was or how far he could fall, but every now and then they encountered a large path of the glowing moss in exactly the right place to illuminate the danger. Despite these momentary flashes of light and terror, they reached the cavern floor without incident. For the first time, Arthur looked back and was unnerved to see a long line of moving green light zigzagging back up behind them. It looked as if all 800-odd followers of the cup were coming down the path, all very quiet now in contrast to their shouting outside. "'We approach the cup," whispered Jebenezer. He, he pointed ahead, indicating a straight way lit by regularly spaced clumps of luminous moss. At the far end, Perhaps 200 feet away, there was a soft golden light that occasionally twinkled with a red glint as if there was a distant fire caught by a mirror. The carp's road is flat. There is no danger. You should go ahead here, Lord Arthur, and we will follow. Arthur let go of Jebenezer's belt and started walking slowly towards the gold red light. He was having last minute doubts with each step. Surely the carp had to be part three of the will. But what if it wasn't? What if it was some other powerful entity, something like the old one in the coal cellar? Something strange, strong and dangerous that was expecting some other kind of rightful heir, somebody else entirely? As he drew closer, Arthur saw that the green-lit road ended and there was a band of darkness. Beyond that was a kind of sunken arena or theatre, a deep bowl with terraced sides where the denizens could sit. The gold-red light came from inside the bowl, but it was a deep enough bowl that he could not quite see its source. Arthur crossed the darkness and stepped down on the first terrace. He paused there for a moment, looking down. The light came from a huge glass bowl about 20 feet in diameter, with a bronze lid that appeared to be riveted to the glass in some way. The bowl was full of sparkling clean water, and in the water was the biggest goldfish Arthur had ever seen. It was ten feet long and six feet high, with huge goggly eyes and a long moustache and long moustache like tendrils hanging down from its mouth. Arthur stepped down to the next terrace and the next. There were forty in all before he reached the lowest and stood in front of the glass bowl. The goldfish watched him approach, just bobbing up and down. It didn't look very intelligent. Arthur cleared his throat, not without some difficulty, and spoke. Greetings. I am Arthur, chosen by part one of the will to be rightful heir to the house. I knew you were coming, said the carp, its words mysteriously echoing all around the arena. Its voice was a strange pitch, okay, <laughs> I went the wrong way with that one, and could have come from either a deep-voiced woman or a high-voiced man. It is as I have told me followers, all true to your faith that the rightful heir will come. The pirate fever few will be cast down and we shall return to the house. You are part three of the will, aren't you? 
asked Arthur. It was hard to see through the curved glass, but he could see that the fish was actually composed of tiny shining letters moving in lines. Its skin was like the detailed etching on a banknote. From a distance, it looked like solid colour, but up close you could really see what it was made of. Mm, indeed I am, replied the carp. It did a circuit around the bowl and returned to face Arthur. What was your name again? Oh, goldfish. <laughs> Memory of a goldfish. Whoopsie. There you go. That was our chapter. I'll keep that voice for the carp. I kind of like, kind of like with his, with his droopy tendril moustache. I, I kind of went with a 60s hippie vibe. <laughs> I don't know. Is that how 60 hippie talked? I don't know. My dad was a hippie in the 60s. He doesn't talk like that. The Magic Roundabout. You ever seen that? That's an old program from, from, I think it was only in the UK. Sorry, America. It'll be on YouTube. Um, the Magic Roundabout. Look for the re the rabbit. Den I think his name was Denzel or Dylan, the rabbit. Look for him. That's who I was going for. <laughs> Enjoy that one, won't you? The Magic Roundabout. Wee. Okay. Thanks very much for listening. See ya. Unless you're here for a bit of waffle. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I've been to my mum and dad's tonight. Went and had a look at them. They only live a couple of villages down the road. So, like I said, I, I live by the, the posh um, royal area. They live by the beach. And it's only down the road. So, um, yeah, went down there, got some sea air. We actually sat out in the garden and had some had some tea time. So, um, yeah, it was quite nice, quite pleasant. Uh, what else? Um went into work this morning. I had loads of bits to do. I've been super busy this week. And, um, yeah, so I had to go to work this morning. Uh, Phoebe has gone camping this weekend. <whistles> Crazy. Uh, but she's going to go and see Blake tomorrow with her mum. So she'll be able to report to me how he's looking. And then, because I was going to go next week, wasn't I? But hey, he says he's coming home. Oh! that's exciting i hope he does because one of the he lives there's him and two two girls who live in the same um dorm i don't know what they're called block but um they both live here as well which is really weird isn't it by pure coincidence they three got put together maybe it wasn't coincidence maybe it was like oh we'll put them together because they live near each other in the real world and um yes yeah, so one of them is coming home so he's coming home with her so that's all right that makes sense doesn't it so, uh, yeah, hopefully, fingers crossed, it'll be good to see him next week. Um, what else has happened today? Cut the grass today as well, front and front and back. That wore me out. The grass was like that, <laughs> that deep. So, um, yeah, wore me out. Gosh. Um, car wash day tomorrow. You've got to do it every weekend, don't you? Oh, <laughs> just, so I just drove home from my mum and dad's house in my posh car and um because my it is very clean because i do clean that until the paint is wearing off and especially i love the lights they look pretty so i give them a good polish and on the way home because it's dark i don't know whether you can see because it's dark um i had my lights on and coming the other way the cars were flashing their lights i was like <laughs> my lights aren't on full beam they're just very very clean so i was really chuffed driving along then i realized as i got down the road the popo were sitting down there with their old radar gun checking speeds so um yeah they were flashing me to let me know <laughs> to keep i of course i was going the speed limit anyway of course i was but um yeah they weren't flashing me because my lights were so bright because they were so sparkly clean they were flashing me to say popo are down the road mate Oh well, I thought my lights were clean. Anyway, thanks very much for listening tonight and uh what is it? Sunday tomorrow. So I'll see you tomorrow Sunday night. Sunday scaries. <laughs>